Okay. I think that worked. You think it worked. We appear <laughs> to be on air. So we be, appear to be on is, air. Is I anyone no watching? Yeah, no, there's people watching. I can see there's people watching. <laughs> Hopefully we haven't scared them away. Sorry about the late start. Uh, Pamela was in kind of back-to-back -back yeah. all morning. Sorry. Right? Yeah. And so she had to, uh, you know, recuse herself from one and then be able to sort of jump into this one. And there's a, you know. Yeah. I had to reboot my computer was the real problem. So yeah. we're sorry. Reboots. <laughs> Reboot, reboot. Yeah. Um, right, so if anyone has no idea what this is and what you've stumbled into, we are going to be recording a live episode of our uh, long-running Astronomy Cast podcast. Today's episode uh, 293. Uh, title is Earthquakes. Now, the date is for February 11th because we're still doing a catch-up, and uh, so we're about three weeks behind, so that's why the date will say February 11th, but it'll sound normal in the feed. Uh and then uh, we'll sort of stick around after we record the show for a few minutes. Now, I know Pamela's pretty busy today, so I don't think we're going to have a lot of time today. Uh, but if there's a few cool questions, we'll try and try and get them. Uh, now, if you want to ask a question, you can, or if you want to, like, pose some questions while we're doing the show, and if I sort of notice and think, oh, yeah, we can totally, I can totally include that, then by all means. So you can post your question on, uh, on the event page on Google+. You can post it on YouTube, or you can post it just on the Google Plus stream if you're watching it somewhere there, or if it's somewhere embedded and you like to use Twitter, just use the hashtag AstronomyCast, and I'll try and notice all the comments as we as we go. Um, cool, and so it'll take us about half an hour, and then when we're done the recording, give us a second just to save up everything, and then uh, and then we'll answer your questions. Uh, so bef and before we get on to it, I guess one last reminder, uh, which is that we're going to be at South by Southwest on. Uh, Wednesday night, well, Thursday, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then flying back out on Monday. So if you're going to be at South by Southwest, we are going to be at the huge model of the uh, of the James Webb Space Telescope, which is... And, and just to note, we understand South by Southwest doesn't start till Friday, but we get there early to set up. So <clears throat> yeah, um, yeah. Drop us a, a tweet. We may camp out someplace. Um, I'm I'm thinking Kirby Lane is in our future, and you will What's be that? invited. It's it's a funky cafe that oh, has nice. the most amazing food. I desperately miss it. I went to grad school in Austin, so this oh, okay. is a chance so you for know me well. to get my favorite foods. Yeah, I've only been there once. It was great. Great city, though. Uh, and unfortunately, we're, the plan is that we're going to try and do a, a virtual star party from Austin. So we're going to have access to all these cool telescopes. We're going to try and broadcast live and do a virtual star party. The problem is the weather the forecast weather. Yeah, right. is looking like thunderstorms. So... We'll do what we can, and I I use this as an excuse to get great new waterproof boots. I will bring my rain gear. I, you know, as a as a West Coaster, uh, Northwesterner, we we have rain gear here, so I'm ready. But uh, still, be I was hoping to go somewhere warm and sunny, but yeah, no, it's Austin and winter. <sighs> Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. All right. Well. So, are you uh, are you ready to record? I I think so. There will be a fair amount of we we've wandered out of astronomy into geology with this episode. So there's going to be a fair amount of mad flipping between windows in the background here. But I think we're good. Well, I hope to tie it all together to space <laughs> quakes as well. So yeah, but those are still planetary scientists and geophysicists. Yeah. So now you've good to stretch. Frozen here on my I screen. Have. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but you've frozen on the screen. I will stop moving. No, so you're, no you're fine now. You're fine now. Okay. 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 All right. Well, I'm going to press record. Are you press record? Okay. Um, yes. Nice. Okay. And it's working? Mm-hmm. And it's in mono? Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's All rock. Is good. Okay, good. Here we go. Astronomy cut. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, first, first word. I can't even say the words astronomy cat. Oh. Sorry, Preston. So, no, it's okay. We'll just stop it and start the recording. Okay. Again. Good, because I like totally do overloaded this? my levels. No, no, no. Why do we do this live again? I forget. It was your idea. That's oh, all I have my, to say. Yeah, all right. I hope you people appreciate this. Okay. Are you ready to record? Yes. Okay. I've pressed record. Okay. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 293 for Monday, February 11th, 2013. Earthquakes. 
Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest.org. Hey, Pamela, how's it going? It's going well. How's it going with you, Fraser? It's going really well. Now, unfortunately, through the sort of madness of space and time, we are recording this before we leave for South by Southwest, but by the time it gets into your feed, it will be after. So I hope we had fun. Yes, yes. And, and I hope you got a chance to meet us and see us and say hi to us. So that's very confusing. Time, yes. W- wibbly wobbly timey wimey, right? I'm not that kind of a doctor. <laughs> you're not that kind of a doctor, no. No, you're an astrophysicist. We're pretty close, though. I'm pretty bad at so you can figure it out. All right, so let's get right to the show then. Um, <clears throat> so we always say that the universe is trying to kill you, but actually, the Earth isn't so fond of you either. Certain parts of the planet Earth are prone to earthquakes where the, Earth, where the planet's shifting plates can cause the ground to shake violently. We've had a few devastating earthquakes in recent years, but do they also happen on other worlds? Uh, have you ever been in an earthquake, Pamela? Um, I've been in earthquakes of sizes that make you consider whether or not you need to stand in your driveway, but that haven't caused damage more significant than cracks in the walls. But I've, I've experienced a steady stream of earthquakes in all sorts of different places on the planet. So I live on Vancouver Island, which is uh, one of the most earthquake-prone places on Earth. Really? And oh yeah, yeah. No, we have we we share the same fault pretty much as California. So we're okay. on the Ring of Fire, and we get really pretty bad earthquakes here. Um, and yeah, so I've been in a, I've been in a few already. Uh, one was pretty nerve-wracking. I was in a tall office building in Vancouver, oh, and no. the earthquake was going, and the, it was ended up being about five and a half, I think, yeah. on the I was, we guess we'll get to the scale, um, but the whole building was was creaky. You could hear the girders inside the building creaking back and forth. So it was kind of, like, ee, 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 you know, while wow. you're, yeah, it was it was nerve wracking. And then the other one that happened, this actually happened just a couple of months ago, and I didn't feel it, but there was like a really big, like a seven point nine that was a, a few hundred kilometers from where I live in the okay. uh, Queen Charlotte Islands. Yeah, and so that was big, but fortunately it hit a pretty unpopulated area and so nobody wow. was nobody was hurt but but yeah so we actually and we're expecting the big one and so we have tsunami warning sort of systems all over the place and uh, wow. you know our kids teach I had to write a letter this is really sad I had to write a letter to my children about how if there was an earthquake that I you know mommy and daddy love you very much and we're gonna try and come and find you but you know help other people so you have to write a sad letter to your children while they wait for you to And this is them. like on file with your school system? Yeah, yeah, so they give it to the kids. So they have it ready to go for the kids. It's, they have their letter that I'm going to come and help them out if, you know, if there's an earthquake and we can't reach each other. So, yeah, yeah, so we live in earthquake central. Yeah, we earthquake country here on Vancouver Island and Cougar country, but that's a whole other story. Um, you know, we have both those things here as well, but we, we're missing the tsunami part. And that, that's one of the things that people don't realize is you don't have to be on one of the big plate boundaries that everyone thinks of to experience earthquakes. And here in Illinois, we have the San, San Madres Fault, which uh, is responsible for destroying the city of St. Louis back in the 1800s. And it periodically lets off some moderate-sized earthquakes, and they're waiting for the next one that reflects in St. Louis, and we just don't know when that's going to happen either. So, uh, yeah, we have the Cougars. My university mascot is, in fact, the Cougar. Um, and ironically, the first year that I lived here, my husband went on a business trip in California, and prior to leaving, he said he hoped he didn't experience an earthquake while out there. And I woke up in the middle of the night and went to kick the dog for scratching on the bed and making the bed shake and realized the dog was not on the bed and it was an earthquake. And I had this moment of, well, I grew up in California. I know I'm supposed to go stand in a doorway, but I'm in a 120-year-old house on top of two nice Tempur-Pedic mattress and box spring sets. And if the house is going to collapse, I'm probably better where I am on top of the foamy stuff. So I just sort of stayed place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, so then let's let's sort of go back then and, and get to the geology lesson part of this uh, <laughs> this actual show, uh, <clears throat> the science that everybody's waiting for. Science. And, 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 yeah. And so, like, what is an earthquake? It it at the end of the day is the planet Earth or whatever world it's occurring on, releasing pent up elastic energy that. Uh, 
as as the plates of the the planet move, they build up stress in a variety of different ways. Um, sometimes the stress is actually magma welling up from underneath, and it cracks the surface. Sometimes it's two plates moving beside one another, and friction stops them from moving. But they're trying to move, and if if you've ever tried to bust open a stuck not, you know that you're pushing on the wrench, pushing on the wrench, and all of a sudden it goes. And, and then you make your your uh, knuckles bloody as you... E exactly. Yeah. And the planet does that too, and the planet sometimes makes more than just your knuckles bloody. And that's one of the unfortunate things with releasing this amount of energy. Now, you said it's a release of elastic energy, but I wouldn't imagine rock to be elastic. Um, I, I think it's because we're used to thinking of rocks as this nice little thing that we use to build walls to to bash things when we're too lazy to go find a hammer and we're small children but but the reality is they're they're just another substance no different than a cement wall or a piece of granite that you can press and press and press and it will only give so much before it breaks and even granite will give a little bit before it breaks and it's that amount of giving that that's the elastic energy getting stored up in the system and so then you know I know that I mean I always do this experiment you know with kids to show them how the earthquakes work is you like you push your hands together really hard and then you try to move your hands one way or the other and your your hands move in these kind of fits and starts yeah and that's that that elastic energy that's being released in these just in these quick um, jolts and, and the majority of the energy doesn't go into the earthquake. The majority of the energy gets released in heating up of the systems in, in uh, things that, that are, are less destructive in some ways, you might say. But what's really terrifying is the bulk of the energy isn't released in the earthquake, if you start to think about it. Right. I know that like with the, um, the Indonesian earthquake and the recent one in Chile... Uh, Haiti. Haiti. I mean, there was a tremendous amount of, of energy that was released. And they always describe it in, like, you know, gigatons of, of, you know, nuclear weaponry. Right. And then they calculate how much the Earth's planet's rotation changes. It, it's a change in the moment of inertia as the planet. Um, it, it, this, this is one of those things that we forget to, to realize is we are essentially a liquid-filled ball. And, and one neat experiment that you can do um, is, is take three cans of soup, uh, empty one out and eat it, keep the other one nice and friendly liquid, and freeze the other one and make sure it's something like chili that won't cause the can to deform because of the water expanding. You now have three objects, one solid, one liquid, one empty. Roll them down a slope, and they're going to roll at different rates because they have a different moment of inertia. This is the same effect as an ice skater goes faster when they pull their arms in and slows down as they put their arms out. Those are different moments of inertia. This means the mass is distributed in a different way. Well, if you physically move where the solid rocky stuff floating on top of the magma is on the surface of the planet, that's the equivalent of moving how your hands holding, in this case, weights, are located held away from your center. So this changes how the planet rotates just like, well, freezing and thawing that can of soup changes how it rolls down that inclined plate. Now, I know that there are different kinds of, I guess, different kinds of plate interactions that can lead to these different kinds of earthquakes, right? Right. And, so, and then, then there's other events, too, like volcanism and, and even just like some random events. So, so let's talk about, like, what are the underlying causes? What, what will get you an earthquake? <laughs> well, so, so the things that will get you an earthquake, um, it, it basically boils down to you have plates that are either slipping beside one another one is going up or it's going down. Um, so so those are the basic geometries. You have subduction going in. Um, you have also things get created and they well apart. Um, so you have in the center of the ocean, we don't luckily experience this one on land very much. You have um, the plates moving apart and even moving apart with the magma welling up, that's still is things moving and creating tectonic energy. Um, 
yeah, it, it's things moving, and as they move, they have to either go up, go sideways, or go under. Those, those are basically the choices you've got. And you've got this situation, right, where they're, where they're not moving just smoothly. The plates aren't no. just sliding against each other really smoothly. They're really just kind of going in fits and starts. And right. the longer it's taking to move, then often the, the sort of worse the earthquake is going to be. Right. And, and depending on how the waves get to you, you also experience them in different ways. Um, anyone who's been through multiple earthquakes, you, you may have started to notice that sometimes it's just like everything suddenly goes kaboom, and you're not sure if it was a sonic bo boom or an earthquake. Um, sometimes you'll sit there and feel like um, a really large semi-truck or train just keeps going and going and going and going past where you are. This is if you watched any of the videos from the Japanese earthquake where they actually had this continuous rumbling motion. All That's of what these, ours feel like. Yeah, and and what you experience depends on the geology of the land that you are on top of and where you are relative to the originating source of the earthquake. When, when these events happen, they, they send waves propagating through the planet. And one form of these waves, the pressure waves, the P waves, these, these work just like sound waves moving through the atmosphere or moving through water or ground, where it's basically a compression wave that moves through the ground and, and jolts things as it goes. This is a very fast-moving wave. This is actually the wave that when your dog starts going off prior to the earthquake, uh, starting to make things shake in a noticeable wave, what your dog is keying in on is that P wave that is moving fast, getting to you first. And the P waves, they, they can go through through all different types of materials. They're going to propagate through water. They're going to propagate through land. They're going to get you no matter where you are. Right. So that's, that, that's one kind of wave. Now, in addition to that, we have S waves. These are um, up and down waves. So the way to think of these two is if you take a slinky, and, and I should have found a slinky prior to this episode, um, if you send a wave that makes the rings in the slinky get closer and further away as it moves through the slinky, that's a P wave. An S wave is where you move the ends up and down, and you end up with the slinky uh, forming a series of side-to-side -side S's turned on their side that are all interconnected. This is your sine wave essentially moving through. This requires a rocky body. This requires soil. So this requires something solid that the S wave is going to move through. So we can actually map planets using earthquakes by looking to see when does the P wave arrive, does the S wave arrive, um, and it's, it's by combining this information that we're able to figure out where inside of planets do you have the liquids, where do you have the solids that allow the S waves to transmit as well. So in, in an earthquake, will we feel both of those waves? Will we feel the P wave and feel the S wave? You may not feel the P wave. You'll definitely feel the S wave. Um, but it's, it's actually one additional type of wave. It's, it's the, the surface waves that cause the, the massive damage. So you have the P waves and the S waves that are traveling underground. And then the surface waves, this is kind of the planetary equivalent of taking a sheet and shaking the edge and seeing this single wave go rippling across the top of the surface. Um, there, there's a lot of particle movement that's lateral that causes this to happen in addition to the up and down that gets experienced. And this is where all of, of the damage ends up occurring. Um, you also end up with particle motions where you end up um, underneath this eddy with these rolling motions of the particles underneath as everything essentially gets flipped around and rearranged. And so, you now you mentioned briefly about how the, uh, how earthquakes are used to actually, I mean, not just as a, sort of a dangerous natural disaster, but actually scientists use them to probe the interior of the earth. So what's, the, what's right. going on there? Um, and it's, it's not just the earth that we've done this with. We've actually actively tried to do this with the moon. Uh, so what's happening is we have all over the surface of our world a series of seismic detectors. In some cases, these are detectors that are set up to monitor uh, earthquake zones because uh, since, since earthquake waves do, well, as many of us know, move slower than the speed of Twitter, uh, these, these move at... at fairly reasonable speed such that if there's an earthquake in Los Angeles that goes off, you have time to 
well, contact people that are tens to hundreds of miles away and say, earthquake. Um, so we have monitoring stations set up. These are also used to sound uh, tsunami warning alerts. And uh, Japan has a series of networks that will actually send off alarms when an earthquake is set is sensed somewhere so that people have that chance to get under their desk before the earthquake hits where they are. Uh, we also have detectors that are used to monitor for things um, more mundane and in some ways more dangerous such as nuclear explosions. A nuclear explosion under the ground will trigger a, a characteristic set of seismic waves to move through the planet. Uh, so we watch and monitor nations like North Korea using, well, the artificially generated uh, seismic activity that they create when they test weapons. Uh, we also monitor volcanoes this way. It's when you put all this data together, you map the inside of the planet. Right, but and, and I guess specifically, right, you get this situation where the waves move at different speeds or different refraction angles through these the different layers in the Earth, and that's right. how you can probe where they are. Right, so the, the P waves, they're going to move through everything, and they're going to move at a set speed. So just like we can use the speed of light to figure out um, when did this uh, event go off, off the surface of the planet based on Boston sees it first and uh, Cape Town sees it later, well that means that the light had to travel, um, let's assume that it's not actually light, something like neutrinos that will travel through the planet. So say you're detecting neutrinos from a gamma ray, from a gamma ray burst. If you detect them in Boston first and then Cape Town later, you know um, which one of those two places was physically closer to the source. Well, we can do the same thing with seismic detectors. Whoever detects it first is closer, and by having these spread all across the surface of the planet, you can measure all the different travel times and pinpoint the location um, of the epicenter of the earthquake. So now, as, as I sort of mentioned at the beginning of the show, we're going to talk about how this is actually a common feature on on many objects in the solar system. So, you know, what are some other places in the solar system where scientists have detected some kind of like motion? Uh, the the primary place that we've we've detected these things is is the moon. We we dumped some uh, seismic detectors on the moon. They're not working anymore, um, but but they were there and. Um, we, we basically weren't so much detecting tectonic motion in the moon. We weren't detecting volcanism. The moon is dead. But we were detecting when the moon got clobbered by small rocks falling from the sky. Oh, really? So you're actually able, you know, your yeah. a moon quake is the moon getting hit by some object somewhere on its surface. And, and we were able to detect the, the meteor... Uh, explosion over Russia from from seismic detectors as well. Uh, yeah, you hit the planet and it rings like a bell. You hit the moon and it rings. And just like you can determine the geometry of a bell from how it rings, you can determine the geology of a planet or a moon from how it rings. Now, is there a, you know do you know is there any earthquakes on Mars? Mars quakes? So far as we know, Mars is also seismically dead. Um, in the past, clearly it had all sorts of interesting activity. Look at the volcanoes that it has on it. Uh, but nowadays, were we to set up a seismic system, as far as we know, and this may not be entirely accurate, we're always learning new things. As far as we know, uh, Mars is for the most part seismically dead, and we wouldn't expect to detect anything except from impact events. But we, you know, I know that scientists are still not even sure when Olympus Mons shut right. down. Right. So, right. And so you could have a situation that could even have another eruption. So we don't really know how long it's it's been. And so there could be quakes near the near Olympus Mons if there is well, something it, moving it, underneath. It, more more than likely, uh Olympic Mons is is part of a volcano chain that is from a series of different hot spots that had the volcanoes erupt above them, just like the islands of Hawaii are a series of hot spots that, that formed islands above them. And as the plate moves, the hot spot wells up new islands. Um, so what we're actually seeing is on one side of the Hawaiian islands, new islands that are bright and sharp and poking up out of the ocean. And on the other side, ones that are more weathered and starting their decay back into the ocean. On, on Mars, there's a chance that we could get, if it 
is still active. A new crack in the surface that outgasses and oozes however it will, it's, it's unlikely, given all of the information that we currently have on it, that we're going to see a new giant well, Mons, new giant volcano form, um, but there's always the potential for outgassing, and that might explain some of the methane detections that we have had on this little world. Now, when I think of the poster child for volcanism, I think of Io. So, yes. would there be earthquakes on Io? I, I think they'd be called Io quakes. Io quakes, of course. Yeah, moon quakes, and, and Mars quakes, and, and Io quakes. And and these are going to be magma magmatic eruptions, which is always fun to try and say, uh, caused by this constant upwelling of, of lava from inside this very molten, very uh, torqued planet that's currently undergoing just tidal forces that are ever-changing, squishing its system like a squishy ball, like a stress ball. And as, as that magma comes up, it's, it's not a smooth and easy process. Anyone who lives in Iceland has experienced this for themselves. If, if you watch the seismic monitors in Iceland, you see a whole variety of different activities that vary from uh, just normal tectonic activity as the plate that is split in the middle of Iceland moves apart. Uh, but you also see lots of magmatic activity as different chambers fill, move, uh, new chambers fill. Um, and it's that magmatic activity that you'd also see on Io. But I, I mean, there isn't a lot of solid ground or a lot of places you'd really want to stand on Io. Probably without getting, not. Without getting rock <laughs> raining back down on top of you from these, from these volcanoes. So you would, yeah, it would be a pretty dangerous place. You would, I think earthquakes would be one of the last things you'd be worried about. I, it, it's probably a lot like Hawaii. Luckily, lava is not that fast moving with shield volcanoes that aren't in an explosive eruption. So if you're not at the very top, you, you generally have a chance to, to watch the, the lava flow around you. Now, this doesn't mean that there haven't been lots of tourists in Hawaii who haven't done things like go where they shouldn't and realize they're on the last piece of land that isn't lava and they're thus cut off and have to get rescued with helicopters. Um, but it is the type of process that an alert scientist uh, could observe an eruption without death. Right, right. Now, I wonder about other kinds of... <laughs> of medium, you know, other kinds of media, like, like, you know, it's rock on Earth and magma and such on, on Io, but what about a place that's got a lot of cryovolcanism, like a place well, like, like, Enceladus. Uh, yeah, Enceladus, yeah, Enceladus, or, or even like how Europa has just these, it's almost like they've got plate tectonics, but it's ice, right? It, it is, shifting. it's hydraulic activity, uh, yeah. much like is experienced with glaciers. So just like you can detect glacier movement in, in seismographs, uh, you'd expect on Europa, it's, it's even um, more fundamental to how the, the geology of the system changes, where you have this hydraulically driven motion with upwelling of hot water that that actually circulates the surface at a certain level as well as all the gravitational tidal forces that are that the system's undergoing um, all of this acts to cause uh, neat banding cracks uh, all sorts of interesting spiral formations um, it's it's very complicated and people are still working to try and figure this out but you definitely do get the stress and strain in the system that leads to slip faulting a lot like you see here on earth yeah you could almost imagine like that it would be equivalent to like crossing you know glaciers here on earth yes. and, and and that you know if you were, weren't careful chasms open up and and you'd get these you know as these movements happen you'd get these sort of dangerous conditions i think it would yes. actually be a pretty scary place to hang out on the surface of in in general the time scales that things happen uh, are low enough mm. that that you're good as long as you're not standing right at the place that decides at a given moment to move and and those high places are usually identifiable. Now, do you think that there's, I know places like Venus, which is very similar to Earth in terms of size and mass and composition, yeah. do you think Venus experiences any, any earthquakes? And I'm going to just keep calling them earthquakes. I'm not going to call them Venus quakes. They're earthquakes. <laughs> if, it's, if it's the ground, it's an earthquake. Quake. Even if seismic activity. Yeah, seismic activity. Right. So, so Venus is one of these worlds that 
we're still trying to figure out and it likes to perplex us because it's under this thick cloud layer of, of deadly toxic stuff. Um, but this opaque toxic fumes that, that covered the planet and clouds uh, make it very hard for us to, to get the same level of geologic understanding that we get from looking at Mars and the Moon. We have done radar imaging of the surface of, of Venus. Uh, the Magellan Space Probe did this. And as near as we can tell, it does have volcanoes and it has a very young surface. It doesn't have the amount of cratering that we'd expect um, from a non-evolving surface. And this has led some to speculate that every once in a while, all of the heat that is built up inside of Venus, because they didn't see any uh, reason to believe that there were plates on Venus. Uh, the idea is that perhaps Venus every once in a while has this massive essentially upwelling across its entire surface where the heat builds up, the heat builds up, the heat builds up, and then the entire surface basically gets resurfaced in a massive outburst of volcanic activity and tectonic activity. So it just like turns itself inside out. Yes. In, in, in what kind of a time frame? Unclear. It, Unclear. It's not short. It, it would be at the order of magnitude million time year. Yeah. But... But still, that would be an unpleasant yeah. place. To, it was already yes. unpleasant to be hanging out on. It would Not make going it even. There. That would really take it to the hell, you know, scape. Yes. <laughs> right. Now, I guess one last question for you is, do you think that were there more earthquakes, are there more earthquakes now, or were there, would there have been more earthquakes on the Earth in the past? That That's always one of those interesting questions where different people have different ideas. And, and the reason that they have different ideas is because as our planet cools, just like every other cooling body in our solar system, the seismic activity is is going to get less and less. Um, it's unlikely that there's going to be a massive volcanic outburst again like was experienced in Siberia um, many, many million years ago. Um, and this is in part just because our planet is settling out. But this is happening at the millions of years time scale. So do we experience less earthquakes than were probably experienced by uh, plankton that first occupied the oceans and got slushed onto land in tsunamis? Probably. Do we experience fewer earthquakes than early man? Probably not. Um, it's just we've gotten lucky in recent history and anyone who's living in in Haiti or Armenia or China or or Chile or any of these places that have had these magnitude 7 or 9 like was experienced in Japan earthquakes they're thinking lucky but the reality is that what happened in Japan, they were built and constructed for the earthquake. It was the tsunami that was the issue. But anywhere on the planet, we can have a massive slip. And cities like New York, they've done recent simulations and found that that city will collapse if there's a magnitude 7 earthquake. Wow. So we really do need to worry about complacency, about places that aren't prepared to be statistically unlucky. Um, we need to be better about building for earthquakes everywhere that we build, and that costs money, so it doesn't happen. And this is a true concern moving forward. Yeah, we have pretty tight uh, building constraints here on on Vancouver Island and in Vancouver as well. It's yeah, you know, it's very similar to the Japanese standards. And actually, a building that I was in got completely rebuilt for earthquake standards, and it was quite yeah. impressive with cables and and new uh, sort of. To skeletal structure inside the building to, to protect it and so yeah. you know and, and here for example where I live it's all wooden houses like you would not live in a brick house that would be madness and and where I get concerned is when I was an undergraduate at Michigan State um, we had a moderate earthquake like the type that makes you go did I really experience that no. uh, and as a result of it, there there were cracks between the wings of the dorm I lived in and the main part of the building. And they had problems with the brick outer shell to the building started peeling away and they had to do emergency construction to shore up the ability of the brick to stay attached wow. to the dorm building. So that was an earthquake at the level of, I'm not sure I experienced that, but it was Michigan. We weren't prepared. Yeah. 
Yeah, we get those quite a bit. We get those probably every couple of months of like right. just like, you know, is that me having a panic attack or is that an earthquake? So <laughs> right, is that, right. Is that a cat is that a cat, you know, scratching itself or is that an earthquake? So um yeah. Cool. Well thank you very much, Pamela, and we'll it, talk to you next week. My pleasure. Thank you. Now don't leave, we're just saving. Okay. And I'm now going to make it so that I can see Fraser because we don't actually look at each other while we're recording because that's just too distracting. I saw a, uh, a like a little periscopey gadget you can put over your webcam that that will then sort of allow you to look into the camera and look at the person that you're talking to at the same time. That's kind of awesome. Yeah, but I'm not, not sure it would fit over my camera. So, and I'm going to actually drag. I'm going to start uploading it as well. Okay. So that I forget. Okay, cool. Um, all right, we got a bunch of questions. So how, how's your time? I know I know you're like busy as an understatement <laughs> today. So. Yeah, if, if we can keep it to maybe five questions. Sure, no problem. Uh, okay, so um, uh, Johanna Horn asks, how does earthquakes tie into the formation of mountain ranges? Um. It, it's part of the process, clearly. Uh -oh. The formation of mountain ranges is you have two plates coming together. What? Hello? Yep, yep, we're, we're good, we're good. Okay, so, so what happens with the formation of mountain ranges is you have two plates coming together and welling up, and during that process there will be earthquakes released. Um, oh, you've misspelled CosmoQuest on your uh, lower third. That's hilarious and embarrassing. <laughs> That's going to um, be in the entire recording. It's just, yeah, no, it's just in the YouTube, you know, people know. Cause... Just show Comzo Quest. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Last wow. week, I think I just put publisher and forgot to put universe. Today, so. <laughs> you did. That's yeah. true. <laughs> so. Again, we are human beings here, people. Um, yes. Thanks, Clive. Uh, that was great. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so uh, Graham Stickings asks, uh, "How is the Richter scale calibrated?" We actually didn't talk about the Richter scale versus no. the versus magnitude. Right, right. Uh, so, so um, it's it's a log base ten system. So uh, when you go from magnitude one to magnitude two, it's it's actually ten times worse. Um, and and the way that they started putting it together, I mean, nowadays we have machines that measure it, but the general way is uh, less than magnitude 2 is um, it's either not felt or only occasionally felt by very sensitive people. Um, up to magnitude 3 is there's still no damage, but more people feel it. Magnitude 4 um, rarely causes damage. So it's basically based on how much damage is caused based on the type of construction that was used while they developed the scale. So nowadays, even though 7 to 7.9 is described as major, um, which causes damage to many or all buildings over the area of the earthquake. Um, places like Japan with their amazing innovations in earthquake architecture in California, they sort of go, meh, when there's a seven. It's, it's kind of awesome how good we've gotten at handling these things. Yeah, I mean, a 5.5 a 5 .5 around here is you know is interesting like you're the wow that was an earthquake we were definitely in an earthquake there but but nothing really gets you know maybe some people's stuff get knocked off their you know their shelves and stuff but it's not that dangerous beyond five and a half though it starts to get unnerving um malcolm Locke says listening in from christchurch new zealand where we've had over ten thousand aftershocks so far since our 7.3 oh, wow. two years ago yeah amazing wow and that was a pretty devastating earthquake. I know there was yeah. some, you know, a lot of property damage. And that's another place that's, that's sort of in the same situation that we are here in Canada. They take it very seriously. They, you know, people yeah. have building codes. And still, you're gonna, when you do get hit, then that's when, the, that's when you find out how well your building codes did. Yeah, there's a Twitter feed that I follow that I'm now trying to find the name of that tweets every time there's a noticeable earthquake and what's kind of interesting is you can actually spot 
um, earthquake swarms because this Twitter feed goes crazy. Um, that's interesting. And, is that from people I going? I think find... I just felt an earthquake. Like no, is that... no, it's 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 actually um, the the Twitter feed keys off of the seismographs. So it, it's based on it's it's an automatic tweet. So when you get all these different earthquakes from a series of foreshocks and aftershocks around the main event, um, all of that adds up to tweet 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 tweet. And and so it's this one feed you see. Wow. Uh, I I was watching um, basically New Island forming a few weeks ago where there's a whole bunch of events out in the South Pacific, and that was kind of cool to watch. So, uh, last question here, and I think this is a great one. Uh, this comes from Ahmed uh, Fakani. Um, is there a practical way for harvesting this huge energy release during an earthquake shock? Not so much. The best that we can get is is a lot of the places that are high earthquake shock prone are also um, they they have. A, a lot of heat near the surface. This is the Ring of Fire, the Pacific Rim Ring of Fire, where there's also a lot of volcanology. And it's possible to harness that heat for your home, for heating your water. And in Iceland, they've, they've done a variety of different methods to try and figure out how to harness that for uh, geothermal energy of other types. Um, oh, you know, I said that was the last one. I had one more. <laughs> Sorry. And I guess it was Okay. This one was awesome. And then and then I'll let you go. Um, okay. And this one comes from, oh, I lost it. Uh, okay, so it comes from uh, Neil Gupta and asks, the question is, with all of our 21st century high tech, why can we still not predict earthquakes? Scientist, why can't we predict these things? You know, th this is actually something that's somewhat troubling. There, there was actually recently some scientists who uh, had a criminal case placed against them for failing to predict an earthquake in uh, Italy. And, and the issue is that we don't know all of the frictional stress inside the system. So if, if you have two plates rubbing against one another, you can't know exactly how much energy it's going to take to overcome that friction. The, the way to think about it is um, if you're trying to slide something against a glass surface uh, versus against your shag carpeting, you have intuitively a certain understanding of, I barely need to push it on the glass surface, I need to seriously push it if I'm trying to get it across the shag carpeting. We don't know if the fault lines are going to be closer to the glass or to the shag carpeting. And without that extra information, we can't know how much energy has to build up before the system gives, before the system moves. This is that transition from um, static friction to kinetic friction, the, the friction created by motion. You have to overcome a certain amount of energy before things start moving, before they start rolling. Right, and I know that the scientists will will see places that haven't had an earthquake in a long time, and that'll tell them that that this place is due for an earthquake, but they can't still know within with any kind of accuracy because they just they can't see how much right. energy is stored up in the system yet, and I can't imagine a way that they would. I mean, beyond you know, if there's something else that happens, like if there was like these foreshocks that happen in a very specific way, then maybe they'll get a sense that something big is about to happen, but you know, it's there. We'll there are that. warnings put out when there are foreshocks of certain types along certain faults that are understood. All that can really happen is over time we build up more and more information about how different fault lines move. The only problem is that since it is such um, a long-term process, that once we understand a fault, it may be decades, centuries before that fault moves again. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing. Sometimes faults are the first time they've ever even heard found the fault is yeah. when you have that first earthquake and you didn't even know that fault was there. And then, oh, there's a fault there because it just hasn't been moving since people have been taking records. So, right. yeah, cool. Okay, well, now we're going to say goodbye. So thanks, everybody, okay. for, for watching. Thanks, Pamela. What's next if people want to stay tuned uh, to the CosmoQuest uh, Next, uh, tomorrow, Nancy Atkinson may be springing some lunar uh, interviews on you. We're unsure. Um, and Wednesday is Learning Space, hosted by Nicole Gallucci, noisy astronomer, and Georgia Bracey. And uh, we hope to see you then. That will be at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. And Friday, we're going to be doing uh, our weekly space hangout from yes. South by Southwest. Exactly. 
hopefully we'll be able to rope in some special guests. Um, if, especially we'll do if what we can. Especially if it's pouring rain and yeah, we have nothing else to do. Yeah, it's going to be a wet experience. Yeah. So bring and your then, rain here and join us at the NASA tent. And then Sunday night we'll try and do a virtual star party or not. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Well, thanks, okay. everybody. Thanks, Pamela. And we will see you. And we'll see you in person in four days. See, see you soon. Okay. Bye.